And now we're going to hear about another history maker, Dr. Zelma Watson George, who was a diplomat, a presidential advisor, a musicologist, an opera singer, a college administrator, and an all round pioneer. And here to tell us more about Zelma Watson George's story is Hiram College Instructor of Sociology and Director of Hiram's Emerging Scholars Program, Dr. Anisi Daniels Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Zelma Watson George was born in Hearn, Texas. She was the daughter of um, a pastor. He was a Baptist minister. And as you can see, Hearn is between Dallas and Houston. She later moved to a number of other places, right? and she remembers the presence of prominent black thinkers in her home. Some of these names you might recognize, W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, and Carter Woodson. Walter White as well. Her family lived in Dallas for a short time, but they had to leave. Part of the reason was her father incurred the wrath of white residents of Dallas. The reason was he assisted black prisoners, and the white residents of Dallas believed that black prisoners were not worthy of any type of assistance or uh, social intervention. He was threatened by Dallas authorities and vigilantes. So he moved to Topeka, Kansas, where Dr. Watson uh, completed her education and her father accepted a pastorship there in 1917. After completing her education, she enrolled in the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago represents the cradle of sociology, sociological thought and applied sociology, where people are not just learning, but they are applying sociology to situations outside of the campus. Because the university would not permit her to live in dorms with white women, her father accepted a pastorate in Chicago so that she would have somewhere to live. She obtained her degree in sociology and in 1925, she went on to enroll in the American Conservatory of Music. She also served as a social worker for the Associated Charities of Evanston, Illinois. And as you can see on the bottom, this is the original building for this particular work. And she was a probation officer for the juvenile court in Chicago. From 1932 to 1937, she was a dean of women and director of personnel administration at Tennessee State University in Nashville. She moved in 1937 to Los Angeles, where she established and directed the Avalon Community Center until 1942. And that community center still stands today, providing services, particularly to those who are um, addicted to various substances. With the assistance of a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, she then moved to Cleveland, where she researched her dissertation. And she began a lengthy career of civic involvement. And these are some of the organizations with which she was involved in Cleveland. So for those of us who say that we don't have time to do these sorts of things, I want to remind you that you can. Besides, I just sat in a movie theater for two hours watching Black Panther. We'll see it again, and we'll probably see it again. Am I the only one? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. All right, so we have time for the things that are important to us. And here are some of the organizations to which she gave her time. Also, in 1944, uh, she married attorney Claiborne George after her for first marriage ended in divorce. There's also a lesson here. If the first one doesn't work out, on to the next one. <laughs> Beginning in 1949, she performed in several stage presentations. She played and sang the lead role in Giancarlo Minotti's The Medium, which was an opera that ran for 67 nights at the Caramu Theater, which I'm guessing many of you are familiar with, in Cleveland. And for 13 weeks, on the bottom left, you can see she performed at the New York City Edison Theater at the request of the original creator of the opera. Part of the reason why this is significant is because this role was not created for a woman of color. But the creator himself realized that because of her excellence that she was the person who could fill this role. Once again, another lesson to be learned, just because it hasn't been done yet doesn't mean that it can't be. And perhaps you haven't seen it yet because it's up to you to do it. 
After the medium closed on Broadway, she received the Merit Award for, for the National Association of Negro Musicians. She also performed in Minotti's other work, The Consul, at the Cleveland Playhouse, and she performed the role of Mrs. Peachum in Kurt Weill's The Three Penny Opera at the Caramu. During the 1950s, she became involved with national and international political issues. She served as an advisor to President Dwight Eisenhower's administration. She toured with the Defense Advisory Committee on Women on the Armed Services from 1954 to 1957. And she served in 1958 on the President's Committee to plan the White House Conference on Children and Youth. She was also on the Executive Council of the American Society for African Culture from 1959 to 1971. And as you can see, the mixing and melding of these experiences with women, children, and people of color will result in further work in this area. From 1971 to 1972, President Richard Nixon named her to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, where she worked and on a return trip home from lecturing at Bethune-Cookman College. She stopped in Orlando to visit relatives. During a delay at the airport, she took a seat in a waiting room, minding her own business. She was approached by an officer who told her to leave the room. He said this, get out, you Yankee troublemaker, or I'll throw you out. She responded angrily to a room of about 75 people. I am a United States delegate to the United Nations. Not long ago, I returned from a round the world lecture tour at the request of the State Department. I was trying to create for people in foreign lands an image of my country as a land where all men are created equal and freedom is everyone's birthright. Is there no one in this room who will stand up for me? No one spoke up for her. From 1966, to 1974. She was the director of the Cleveland Job Corps, which experienced tremendous growth under her leadership. Even in her retirement and after the death of her husband, she lectured, she wrote, and she taught at the Cuyahoga Community College, among other places, in the elders program. Her classes were extremely popular due to her experience, her knowledge, and her passion. Among her many awards, she received the Dahlberg Peace Award, and she was selected to the Greater Cleveland Women's History Committee as Women Who Shaped Cleveland. She was the daughter, or she was awarded the Daughter of Ohio Award by the Civic Recognition Committee of Ohio for statewide honors. These are tremendous honors that she received for the work that she did. The story continues. She died, yeah, this is doing the thing. All right, <laughs> okay, it's a good thing I'm not afraid of ghosts, all right? I'm not afraid of anything, so we'll just leave that there so it'll quit trying me. She died on July 3rd, 1994 in Cleveland. And as you can see today, and some of you may recognize the Zelma Watson George Community Center that stands in her honor and also through the Salvation Army, a center, a community center and shelter for homeless women and children were also established. So what does any of this have to do with you? Many times we listen to these presentations during Black History Month and other times and we wonder, all right, we're inspired, but then we walk away. And we wonder, what does this really have to do with me? So I am not just a purveyor of facts, I'm also a purveyor of thought. What does this have to do with you? We have listened to two timelines today of people who have contributed to their community and their world. So I want to talk briefly about this idea of time. First thing this has to do with you is that we owe our visions our time. How many of you in here have a vision for your life? How many of you have thought about where you'll be in five years? Some of you are thinking about where you'll be in an hour, right? Lunch, okay. <laughs> but the idea is that we all have a vision of where we want to go. How many of you are impatient? Right, <laughs> good to recognize that. Here's what I want you to understand. We owe our visions our time. What that means is, is that if it is worth it, we need to give it the time that it deserves. Dr. Watson George lived a long life and she dedicated her time to her vision. 
So what was in front of her was not enough to drive her. It was the vision that she had that shaped the choices that she made and the time and how she used it. Second thing, I want you to think about living beyond your time for the sake of other people. What that means is that it is easy for us to consider what's in front of us right now and not think about how our lives will impact others. At some point in your life, after you are gone, people will be talking about you. What will they say? Your family members will be showing your picture to other people in your family. What will they say about you? Live beyond your time. Think about what you want to leave behind. Think about what's not here that you can create for the sake of other people, as Dr. Watson George did. Face racism, sexism, and many other issues. It would have been easy to say, I'm giving up on this because I can't see it. But she chose to live beyond her time for the sake of others. And finally, we tend to think that we don't want to change things because we won't see them. I want you to consider reevaluating your relationship with time. What that means is that your story doesn't end once you're no longer here. Your story doesn't end even when you leave your school. Our stories only end when we assume that the story is about us. And when we understand that our stories are not just about us, time becomes something that goes beyond us. Now, I would like to introduce to you my new friend and colleague here, Susan Hall. Right? So, and she's going to show you some of the artifacts that accompany um, Dr. George, and I wanted to leave her plenty of time to do this because these are exciting things. Right? She is the Director for Community Relations for the Cleveland History Center at the Western Reserve Historical Society. Would you take a moment to welcome Ms. Susan Hall? But well, we need this to work, so put positive energy up so I can keep the slides going. But it's about time, as Dr. Smith said. It's about relationships. It's about stories. And to give you a little bit more about my background, I am a historian. I'm a curator of exhibits. I work in the archives. And what you're going to see next are some of the first time many people have seen these images about Zelma Watson George. Her life is prolific, it was amazing, and upon her shoulders, I stand, and so will you. I had the pleasure of being in her presence at an event once, but I got to personally meet her through the stories of her goddaughter and some of her friends and colleagues through the years. Her goddaughter was also my college roommate. So as you see in some of these pictures, I'm gonna make a nod to it now, she was very formal. And she came up in a time that was also very formal. And she always wore dresses, of which I do not have one today. But she often wore her strands of pearls. So as a nod to her, I wear them today. One of the mantras she gave us was to be prepared, be ready, be appropriate, be dignified, and to live your best life. She wasn't afraid of being a trailblazer. She just did. Um, Dr. Smith talked about her being divorced. That was really not common in those days for a woman to initiate the divorce and then move on and go on and not stay at home. She was highly, highly educated. But for some, we need to see what did she look like? She also was just like us. She was a baby. She was somebody's child. And that all of these images that you're seeing are coming from her newly processed and cataloged collection at Western Reserve Historical Society and the Cleveland History Center Research Library. We received over 100 boxes. So think about a banker's box about the size of this counter, filled with her belongings, her papers, her writings, her books, her videos, her awards, her plaques, letters to famous people, letters to her husband, and they too had a love story. And all of those things are there now for any of you to come and look at, to call up in a box and say, I want to learn more about when she was young. I want to learn more about when she was working on her sociology degree. I want to see her dissertation that was not published 
because she's also a musicologist. She did a study that's about 12, I think it's 1,200 works of music by Negro composers and musicians and the like. Um, she was very dynamic and different. And see, there goes that thing that's living in our pictures. But as a young lady, dressed in the era of her day, but she always wore sensible shoes. She didn't wear tennis shoes, though. Um, she always wore her hair up, too. That's another thing. She has a signature. Sometimes we get signatures. Sometimes we don't. But there she is with her mother, Lena. Um, her mother and her father encouraged her to go to school. When she was 16 years old and was going to attend college in Chicago, her parents moved with her to Chicago because she was A, too young to live alone, and B, because of segregation, she could not find a place safe to live for as a black woman. And her whole family went with her to live there. And there she is with who became the love of her life, her second husband. So um, things could happen in the next round if they miss out on the first one. But um, Claiborne George, as was mentioned, he was a councilman and an attorney. And he was powerful in his own right. They had no children. They were the early power couple right here in Cleveland. They traveled the world. They traveled abroad. They worked together. And they worked apart. And he was quite supportive. He didn't want her to always be traveling around the world, but he didn't expect nor dictate that she be a housewife. She got her PhD actually at the age, I believe, of 50. So she had, what, three degrees? It never stopped her, her age, her race, or her gender to achieve in a place where many women were held back. At a time that is so different than today in many ways, but in some ways still the same. So you gotta follow your dream. And here goes a picture as you saw earlier from the median. She was the first African American woman to star in a leading role on Broadway in an opera. She also performed at Caramel. And there goes a scene from the median. I believe this image is from New York, from the New York production. Now, she knew a lot of famous people. She too, in Cleveland, is considered famous by many. People admired her, followed her, and there she is with the wife of a president. That's Eleanor Roosevelt. As mentioned already, that she was acquainted and friends with President Dwight D. Eisenhower. He also was the one who then made her an alternate delegate to the United Nations. And at that time, there were only the first three blacks from America, because there were Africans from Africa who were delegates to the United Nations. But um, we'll get to pictures of them as well. And she is standing there with another very powerful, educated woman in Cleveland, and that is Congresswoman Frances Payne Bolton. And you'll find where Dr. George's name is on the rec center at Luke Easter Park at the skating rink and rec center. Frances Payne Bolton's name is on the nursing school at Case Western Reserve University. And both of their papers are housed at the research library at Western Reserve Historical Society. And again, very dressed up. Now my roommate, her name was Sonali Bustamani Wilson. Her father is standing there, and that is John Bustamani. Now we're gonna go back to the previous. Here go the stories and the spider webs of connections and people's relationships. John Bustamani also owned the Call and Post after William O. Walker. And just for the record, the person who owns the Call and Post now is Don King. And Ella Mae Cheeks, her papers are at the Western Reserve Historical Society, and Dr. George, and that was at an AKA celebration here, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. The woman in this um, picture here is Mrs. Chi Kamsia Ibrahim, and they're from the Federation of Malaya, which then became known as Malaysia. So they were at Karamu House, 
and they were looking at some art and it was during a Cleveland Council of World Affairs meeting that was here in Cleveland and a visit to Karamu House. And there she is with the president of Ghana, the Honorable Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. So she got around and around and she was a world traveler. There are great images in the collection. I didn't include all of them obviously, but on a steamship and she's performing and she has on a beautiful gown and she and her friends, um, who were friends of who? W.O. Walker as well. Um, this is a very small, big city. Those are the first delegates right there, the first black United Nations delegates in 1959 and that's Senator Wayne Morse. And there she is conducting business. And there are not that many women now and nor were there that many women then. Um, and she could hold court with anybody. And there she is with whom? Anybody know who that is? There you go. So her reach extended far and wide. He made many visits to Cleveland, um, starting his first one in 1960. And he came to push A for voting rights and to get northern Midwestern states to support civil rights efforts in the South. And here he is with her at the Job Corps. He paid a visit to the Job Corps. And again, with her, some of her ladies who lunch bunch, some would call them, but all of them in their own right were doing lots of great things. I haven't yet to identify all the women in this picture to date, but that's next up. And there she is with First Black Mayor Carl Stokes at a dinner. We jumped ahead again, and here they were meeting with the mayor at the Illuminating Company. So her hands went to about job training, job facilitation, job development for what? Young people through Job Corps. And there she is with the first black male congressman from the state of Ohio, Congressman Lewis Stokes. And here he is again at her office, not at his, because She's running it. <laughs> now she is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. I read um, recently where she said it changed her life um, to be part of an organization of African American women who strive to achieve higher heights in education, business and community service in addition to sisterhood and friendship. I don't belong to that sorority, but I belong to another one, and we espoused those same things. And she wore her colors proud, and she was the founding member in Cleveland of the graduate chapter. And then she also is a founding member of the Cleveland chapter of Lynx Incorporated, which is one of the largest black non-collegiate women's organizations and I'm also a member of that. So again, I stand on her shoulders. And our mission and our motto is service through friendship. And we're 14,000 strong. Um, and so she helped guide numerous women to do service projects for youth, international causes, health, the arts. And with that, there's lots of programs in her collection, pictures, from events and dinners and minutes, as well as for the AKAs. So you can come on down to Western Reserve, you can go through what we call a finding aid, and you can pick and choose the subject. It's by subject and date. You wanna learn more about her in the United Nations? There's programs, there's speeches, there are books, there are letters from President Eisenhower. She and Frances Payne Bolton were very close, and they, there's so, there are numerous pictures. Um, of them doing a variety of things. And here she is back at the Job Corps with the celebrating the dedication of a new what? Dental clinic. So what we know as Job Corps today owes a lot of debt to her and her development at a time where it wasn't just secretarial sciences, it wasn't just get a GED, how to develop yourself, your character, your spirit, your educational background, and your vocational um, prowess so that you could succeed in the marketplace. So with that, 
There's so many more pictures we can look at of her. And I challenge you to come and find out more. And I'll go back one more step. Garrett Morgan, some of you may have got to hear about last week, he was the founder of The Call, which then became The Call and Post. And then as we go on, these things connect. Now I'm gonna talk about John Bustamani a little bit. John Bustamani was also the president and CEO of First Bank National, black owned bank right here in Cleveland. And she was on their board of directors. So she has stepped out in places and spaces. I used to say she led three lives, but it's actually more than that. And the challenges never deterred her. And as Dr. Smith said, how do you fill in your dash? What is your purpose? What are the stories? Who inspires you and who will you in turn inspire? and reach back and bring with you, reach across and be collegiate with and look up to as well. So she was a mentor to many, an inspiration continually to me and many others. And to this day, in addition to her name being on a building, it's up to you and to me to keep her legacy going and find one of those areas or one that she didn't get the opportunity to delve in and make it your own and make it grow. Great presentation, thank you, Susan Hall. And um, if Dr. Anisi Daniel Smith will join you at the podium, um, we will take some questions from our students. And while we're waiting for our first one, um, I, I have a question that, that maybe both of you could address. Um, Dr. Daniel Smith, you talked about um, her, her wonderful um, role in the medium and the chance to do it in New York. And among her many talents, she could have pursued that track and, and I, I think done more of that performing. She chose instead um, to focus on public service in, in many, many ways. Did she talk or write about why she made that choice? Well, part of that had to do with um, diversity of gifts. So she was a big proponent of um, people identifying their gifts and understanding that she could touch many arenas. Oh, can, can everyone um, hear? Yes. Yeah, okay. As Susan talked about, um, that she could touch many arenas with the many talents that she had. And so in some of the brief writings that I've read, um, there seems to be this thread of, you know, whatever I have been given that I will work that to the fullest. So her community engagement um, was not just about stretching out on one area, it was about spreading that talent over many areas. I also read that from her husband, he wanted her to come back home and to be on the road like that and to stay in New York meant that he also would have to relocate and he wasn't in a position to wanna to do that as well. So he encouraged her to come back. So she did perform later on in different operettas, maybe aboard the QE2 as they were sailing to Europe, um, but not as a professional actress. Then roles were also limited, um, age, race, gender, things of that nature. Um, so, but she had so much else to offer, as Dr. Mm -hmm. Smith said as well. I agree. And we have a question now. Your name, sir? Uh, my name is Robert Brown, and I go to Warrensville Heights Middle School. So did Zelma ever ha have somebody to aspire, like look up to? Her father was one of her biggest inspirations. Um, he pushed her to succeed. He pushed her to do. Her mother was very involved in women's causes and women's, what was called the Black Women's Club Group um, at the time. So they encouraged her to go to school and to be educated. I'm not sure who was maybe one of her idols, if you will, but she had mentors at school, mentors at church, but her parents were one of her biggest inspirations. Thank you. I'm Samara from Warrenville Middle School, and I wanted to know if um, Zoma ever like got frustrated or irritated when she was going through bad things in life? Like, yeah. I'm certain she did. <laughs> um, 
she suffered a lot of discrimination when she was in Chicago in university, couldn't live on campus, couldn't join. She was actually an athletic person in her young days, and she wasn't permitted to play on the basketball team, but she was a good swimmer, and she found a way to be able to use the pool. Many pools in many cities across this country, as we learned earlier, were segregated, but she did make the swimming team. So she found a way to go around it, go through it, go above it, and to continue to do her best. So I think that may have been her way to deal with it. I'm sure as many, when people are being maligned, marginalized, um, oppressed, abused, you know, all these buzzwords, um, you gotta reach inside as well as reach outside for help. Mm -hmm. So from her life story, we could see that she faced those challenges one at a time. My name is Island Armstrong, from, and I'm from Shaker Heights High School. And my question is, um, as African-American women, has Zelma inspired you, and if so, how? Sure, make me go first. <laughs> All right, so I can say for sure, um, absolutely, when I was reading the list of people who we could talk about, and I saw that she was a sociologist, I immediately emailed back and said, that one. Um, that I wanted to present on. And the reason why is because many times we are taught to research and that is what we are supposed to do. The activism, the intervention, all those sorts of things in the community are not things that we are trained to do, but because of my own experiences and who I am, um, much of her life resonated with me, that this is not just about gaining the education so you can make the money or so that you can have the title or so that people can look at you and be impressed about what you do. It's about the service that you give and it's about what you leave behind. You know, at some point, you will exit this mortal coil. And you need to leave something behind that other people will benefit from. And so even now, today, as you can see through the community centers and such, that people continue to benefit. So I can say that she has definitely inspired me in that way. Yeah, she's an inspiration to me as well. Um, she's a real person to me, not just someone I met through history book or a, her boxes of personal things. Um, I know the path of which she walked right here. And being a member of an organization that she belonged to that is still thriving um, today is important. And I have a, a different background. I'm a historian today, but my undergraduate degree is in communications with a minor in black studies. And at the time I did radio and TV and documentary film. And not from the historical standpoint that I do it today. And she showed that you can have divergent paths within one life, many of them, and you can follow your dreams, you can follow your passions, you can have new passions along the way. You're not stuck in one vocation or one area. And I think that's what inspires mm -hmm. me. What's next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Oh, sorry. And as you said, um, it's our job to keep the legacy going. I want to say thank you, and you guys are uh, inspiration as well. Oh, nice. That's good stuff. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Heinemann. Um, I go to the Shaker Heights High School. And I asked myself uh, what you guys as experts uh, would ask her if you would have the chance. Uh, what, you know, just like a question, what you would ask her, Zelma? Good. If I could ask her a question today, I would ask her what advice would she give to both older women like myself, on how to keep going when you're juggling multiple balls, how to get through, how did she do it? Now, she did not have children, but she had many godchildren and mentees, as well as the women and men at Job Corps. How did she juggle it all? How do you keep yourself together? And look good while you're doing it, <laughs> all the time. But then I would also ask her to offer words of encouragement in these really troubling times that we live in for young people. You know, how to follow your dream, how to make it happen, how to stick with it, or when it's tough, like the um, young man asked earlier, how to deal with that, when it was a young woman, how to deal with that, to give you words of advice and encouragement on how to get through, how to get to where you wanna go. And uh, what do you think would she like suggest or respond to that? Hard work, 
<laughs> Dedication, hard work. She worked really hard. I mean, she's highly educated. She has three degrees, and she did not stop, say, after her undergraduate degree. Her last one was at 50, and she was doing them in different places. She was at Tennessee State. She was at University of Chicago. She was at NYU. She was at Case Western Reserve. And she was also supporting family members and sending them to school. Yes, her young siblings in Chicago, after her father's death, her mother moved to Tennessee. They were still with her in Chicago. She finished her degree, but she didn't leave until they finished theirs as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. So. Yeah. One, one, one more? OK. I'm Baran with Shaker Heights High School. If she were to be here today, do you think that she would be happy with the rights of African American? Yeah, I would say, I want to speak from what I see and what I know of her, yes and no. We've made great strides. Things are not the way they were when she went to school. The fact that this audience is integrated, we're not segregated, um, by seats, some people in the balcony, or some people outside entirely. Um, women can run for president, and actually, you know, the first African American woman to run for president, using that as a metaphor right here, and facts, was Shirley Chisholm, and that was in the 60s, into the 70s. She was the first black woman to become a congresswoman in this country mm -hmm. in 1969. So in 19, I think it was 71, 72, she was running for president for a major party. Then we had Hillary Rodham Clinton, Secretary of State, Senator, run for president. So I think she would see significant changes, but at the same time, there are pay inequities, um, advancement issues. Should you stay home, should you go to work, should you be married or not? I mean, some issues that haven't changed, so I think she would be proud of the fact that women play sports and women are housewives, that we have choices mm -hmm. and we're not just locked into one space. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And I think that concludes our questions and our presentation. Thank you, Susan Hall. Thank you, Anisi Daniel Smith. Thank you, Kathy Rodebaugh. And thank you all for the great questions. Um, today's presentation concludes the month long series. And we want to uh, say appreciation much to all of you who came to the Westfield or watched the WVIZ live stream. And also thanks to the partners who made this event possible. Enjoy your lunch and travel safely. <laughs> <laughs>